But the question is, where did NBC get it? Are they linking into a box that is sent to them by the RNC? Not clear, I haven't worked it out. And again, it could have been coincidental. But if you were watching Democracy Now! that morning, or listening to us describe that picture, you got to see the Coke Romney handshake. And the networks all showed our double image and showed the handshake. <laughs> Convention. And we were there on the first day of the convention outside. I got a text, something unusual was going to be happening on a street corner right near the convention gates. And I got there with my video uh, colleague, and there were other foreign reporters there waiting. Police across the street, there were massive police presence in both Tampa and Charlotte, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the undocu bus pulled up. It was a bus covered with beautiful butterflies, very colorful. And from this bus came scores of undocumented immigrants, you know, part of the Dreamer movement, an amazing group of people who started in Phoenix and ended up in Charlotte. Now, they come out of this tradition started by young immigrants, undocumented in this country, who have risked so much to change policy in the United States. Because when they engage in civil disobedience, they not only risk arrest, they risk deportation, often to home countries that they have never known. Whole families torn apart. And they have been occupying the offices of President Obama, the campaign offices of Congress members and senators around the country. And to have come to Charlotte, this city of tremendous civil rights tradition. I went to the Levine Museum of the New South on the first day I got there. And there was a lunch counter re-creation. Re, uh, because first Greensboro, North Carolina, right? The students sat in on the Woolworths lunch counter. And they inspired the students from the historically black college in Charlotte, Johnson C. Smith College. And they marched on the Charlotte lunch counter. So it's a rich tradition. I think that the Young immigrants today were organizing to pass the DREAM Act and to have a rational immigration policy in this country are the new civil rights movement. And so these young people now were joined by their parents. And that's who came on this bus. It was not only the young people who were risking arrest, it was their mothers and fathers. We had just interviewed on Democracy Now! that morning, and you should listen carefully. People often do interesting things after they're on Democracy Now! Rosie Carrasco, she was on our show, and she talked about they might be doing something that afternoon. Um, she got out of the bus quickly, and she, along with others, were chanting, no papers, no fear, no papers, no fear. Uh, her husband, Martin Enzueta, came out of the bus, and he said, I have paid taxes in this country for 18 years, which is more than Citibank can say. <laughs> so I was interviewing Rosie. Everyone was getting out of the buses quickly. It was pouring rain. And a well-known television pundit came up to me. I had done some panels with him. He said, hey, what's going on here? It looks like police are moving in. What are these people doing? So I said, well, I think they're about to engage in civil disobedience. He said, tell me what they're saying. So I was then interviewing Rosie. I said, well, why don't you ask her? And he said, J just let me know, what, is she, what did she say? So I said, Rosie, could you tell this gentleman why you just got out of this bus? And she said, because I want to know what kind of legacy President Obama wants to leave. I, wants to leave. She said, I want to know if he wants to be remembered as the president who's deported more immigrants than any other president in U.S. history, or whether he wants to be on the side of the immigrants. And he starts taking out his reporter's notebook and writing it down. Why this hesitance to interview um, people who are the target of policy, rather than we get on all of the networks, these pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. And hopefully he walked on to that network half an hour later where he was headed and being on television and talked about the woman he directly spoke to. And so they went very quickly to the front of the Democratic Convention. It was pouring rain and the police were pouring in and they unfurled this big banner with a big butterfly. 
And I asked this young woman, why the butterfly? Because butterflies know no borders, she said. Butterflies are free. And then I interviewed a woman who had her arm wrapped around her mother. And I went up to her and I said, you look like you could probably qualify for President Obama, the new executive order he's issued that says that undocumented immigrants 30 years or under, under they fit certain criteria. You know, he did this in total response to these, these activists all over the country. It was humiliating to Obama. He was a community organizer before he became commander in chief. He understood the power of this movement that was growing. And so he did grant them this, a reprieve for two years, that they could work here without fear of deportation, that they could go to school here. And I said, you kind of look like you'd be one of those young people. And she said, I am, but my mother isn't. And if she's deported, I might as well go with her. And with that, she and her mother, Rosie and Martin and their daughter, and several other young people got arrested by the Charlotte police. <clears throat> The level of police presence at these conventions, the militarization of police in this country has risen to a level that we all have to question. You know, the Democrats... <laughs> the Democratic and Republican conventions in Tampa and Charlotte, each city, got $50 million more for their police departments. Um, and that pales in comparison to what local police departments have gotten since 9-11. We're talking about billions of dollars for drones, for tanks, for a level of surveillance we have not seen before. AP just did this crusading piece, a series of pieces for which they just won the Pulitzer Prize looking at one police department, the New York Police Department, and what it has done on the East Coast. As far as we know, it's just the East Coast. But it, you could be sure it's not just the New York Police Department. They got under the Freedom of Information Act documents that show that they have been surveilling thousands of Muslims and Arab Americans for years. They do this thing they call mosque crawling. They go to the mosques, they surveil Arab American businesses, students at school. One of the ways this was discovered is a New Jersey landlord, I think he found one of his apartment's doors ajar, and he looked inside, and there was this massive amount of surveillance equipment. So he called the police. <laughs> but it was the police. <laughs> AP's most recent piece, there has not been one lead that has come out of all of this surveillance. The president of Yale University, they not only did this in New York, they went to New Jersey, they went to Connecticut. The president of Yale issued a statement that's saying that this is inexcusable, what they were doing with his students, as you know, he put it. Um, in New Jersey, New Jersey officials, Republican and Democrats, said we knew nothing about this. The New York police are coming into New Jersey to do this? We had on a young CUNY student at uh, City University of New York. He was named in the documents, and his parents didn't want him to come on Democracy Now! or be in the media at all. They, you know, fearful. Immigrants don't want to be called out, don't want to be targeted, and they said, you will endanger all of us. He said, we have already endangered. I've been named in the documents, our only security is if I speak out. So he came on the show and he described what they wrote about him in the documents, what the police had on him. He and his friends had gone to, for a camping trip um, for a weekend. And it turns out probably the infiltrator was the guy who drove them on the camping trip. They didn't know him as well, but they were very accepting and they all went together. And every detail of this trip was written in the police notes. And it said, these students were so extreme that they prayed four times a day. <laughs> and so he said on our show, he said, this infiltrator was so stupid that he didn't know we prayed five times a day. <laughs> but we have something in this country called the Posse Comitatus Act, which says that it's not a good thing to have soldiers marching through the streets of the United States. And I think most of us agree, whether we're Republican, Democrat, Green, Independent, that that's a good thing. 
But I think the way the authorities are getting around this is they are militarizing the police to a level we haven't seen before. And you don't have to take it from me. Take it from Norm Stamper, the former police chief of Seattle. He was the model. 1999, Battle of Seattle. Uh, mass protests of high school kids and their teachers, doctors, nurses, French farmers, um, people of every political stripe, very concerned about the World Trade Organization, a supranational organization that could overturn the laws of democratically elected legislatures. Like, let's say you have, a, uh, you have something here in Charlottesville, a rule that's passed that says you want GMO labeling, not even no GMO food, but GMO labeling on your food and it's passed. So a country could file a complaint with the World Trade Organization and say no, that is WTO illegal, that is an obstacle, a barrier to trade, and yet your rule that you had passed at your local level overturned. And people saw the threat of this at every level. And so thousands marched together, union activists, environmentalists, teachers, all different people, thousands of them. And the Seattle police chief, Chief Stanford, tried to stamp out all the stamp. He hit them with rubber bullets. He hit them with tear gas. He arrested hundreds of them. He says it's the worst mistake of his life. He said, here, I set up our police to see the peaceful protest as a kind of enemy attack. And they're moving in on these kids who could have been their neighbors or their nieces, and they're moving in on them like they are the enemy. And he said, we set up this wall that separates us and doesn't allow us to distinguish. I really do think dissent is what will save us. And that's what Chief Stafford now says and leads the movement against the militarization of police. I was very thankful we got out of the Republican and Democratic Convention okay and made it back to New York. You may have heard what happened to us in 2008 at the last convention. You know, we covered the Democrats in Denver and then flew to St. Paul for the Republican Convention. It was the first day, September 1st, 2008, a beautiful blue sky day. And it started, the convention was gonna start at night and there was this big peace protest in the morning, 10,000 people strong. Start, um, led by soldiers. Soldiers some in full military regalia, others not wearing their uniforms, and it takes great courage to do this, wear your military uniform, protesting war. Some of them had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, some were refusing to go back, some refused to go at all, some were going back, but were deeply concerned. The level of resistance in the military is a story that must be told, because these folks see it on the ground. It's very important to um, speak to people who have returned, and also the pain and suffering they're going through as they return to this country. But they led the march, and then there were thousands of civilians um, who were marching for peace. So we covered this, and we were interviewing people, why did you come out? And then I went to the convention floor to interview delegates from the hottest state, from Alaska. Do you remember that Sarah Palin had just been named? And uh, Sharif, uh, you know, who you know later from covering the Egyptian Revolution, Sharif and Nicole Salazar, a multimedia producer, they went back to the TV studio to digitize tape. And I got a call from Mike Burke, our senior producer, as I'm interviewing people on the floor of the convention at the very beginning that first day. And he says, come quickly, 7th and Jackson, Sharif and Nicole have been bloodied by the police and they've been arrested. I said, what are you talking about? There in the TV studio, he said, no, just get to 7th and Jackson. So I raced out of the TV, out of the convention. I had all my top credentials on. You know, they allow us to interview presidents and vice presidents and Congress members. And we're racing down the street. And we get to this corner, 7th and Jackson. And the riot police have fully contained the area. And I go up to them. And they can see I've just come from the convention floor. And I was out of breath. And I said, can I speak to your commanding officer? My two colleagues are inside, they're reporters, they have credentials like I do. We need to have them released now. It wasn't seconds before they ripped me through the police line, twisted my arms back, slapped the handcuffs on, pushed me up against a car, against the wall, and onto the ground, and charged me with a misdemeanor interfering with a peace officer. <laughs> if only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. <laughs> So I am desperately, from my vantage point on the ground, 
looking for Sharif and Nicole. I can't see Nicole anywhere, but I do see Sharif across the parking lot, his hands behind his back, and I demand to be brought to him. Finally, a police officer agrees to bring me across the parking lot. I asked him to loosen my handcuffs because I couldn't feel my hands anymore. He tightened them, but that's okay. I saw Sharif, and I wanted to be near him. Uh, we needed to be released. So we stood together, our hands behind our backs, our credentials on, and we demanded to be released. You release us now. We're reporters. Release us now. Whereupon the Secret Service came and ripped the credentials from around our necks. So then I was, and Sharif's arm was bleeding. Then I am brought into, hauled into, a police van. And there is Nicole. Her face is bleeding. Her arms are handcuffed. And her press passes on. I said, what happened, Nicole? And she said, well, we went to the TV studio, and we heard a commotion outside. I grabbed the camera, Sharif grabbed the microphone, we ran downstairs. You know, they wouldn't have been doing their jobs if they hadn't gone to see what was happening. It's not an easy job, reporters. It doesn't make us that popular. You know, we're not a party to the parties. We don't party with the parties. We have to hold those in power accountable wherever that takes us. And so, they raced out onto the street. They saw some protesters, but then they saw riot police, and they were in this parking lot, so <laughs> she was up against the parked cars, and she starts to film. She didn't plan to film her own violent arrest, but the police come at her in formation, shouting, on your face, on your face, and Nicole is holding her camera up with one hand. She's filming, and she's holding her press pass up with the other, shouting back, press, press. She didn't know what hit her. From behind her and in front, they slammed her to the ground, face in the ground, near boot in her back, and they're pulling on her legs, so they're dragging her face to the ground. And the first thing to go down when they pulled her down was the camera. It tumbled down, and the police took the battery out of her camera if you were wondering what it was they wanted to stop happening. Um, Sharif is a very cool guy. He tells the riot king police, to calm down. <laughs> they take him, they throw him up against the wall, kick him twice in the chest, bloody his arm, and take him down. They face PC felony riot charges. That's probable cause felony riot. So I am taken to the police garage where they've erected cages to put the protesters in. And Sharif and Nicole are taken to jail. I mean, Sharif goes on to cover the Egyptian revolution. He is not arrested under Mubarak. But he is arrested in the streets of the United States trying to cover what is supposed to be a celebration of democracy. So, the video of our arrest was immediately put online by some media activists within a half an hour. And the response was electric. They had arrested, that week they arrested scores of reporters. So many of the local and some national reporters arrested in the streets of St. Paul. Um, but the video of our arrest went viral. It was the most watched YouTube video of the first two days of the convention. We didn't know what was happening inside, but within hours, I was released, then Sharif and Nicole released, I was brought over to the convention center. Now it's over the first night. And I was, you know, the networks wanted to interview me, so I was in the NBC skybox. And when the interview was done, an NBC reporter, an NBC reporter came over to me and he said, I don't get it, why wasn't I arrested? <laughs> so I said, I said, oh, were you outside covering the protest? And he said, no. <laughs> so I said, you know, I don't get arrested in the skybox either. <laughs> because... says 90% of life is just showing up. You've got to get out there. That is our job. We've got to be on the convention floor interviewing the Abe Lincolns of those conventions. We've got to get into the corporate suites without facing bodily assault, find out who's paying for these conventions, and we have to get out into the streets where the uninvited guests are, sometimes thousands of them, and they have something important to say as well. You know, democracy is a messy thing. And we shouldn't have to get a record when we put things on the record. So, the next day, Chief Harrington, the police chief of St. Paul, holds his news conference to talk about how successful the first day of police operation has been, a kind of model for the rest of the week. And I, we've just gotten a call out of the emergency room. We've got two hours of broadcast to do if this was going to be a model of the week. So I went to the news conference.
conference. And the officer who opened the door of the news conference for me was my processing officer the night before. And I said to him, you not only have to let me in this news conference, you have to let me out when it's done. <laughs> so I go into the news conference and reporters are asking questions. I raise my hand, I describe what happened to Sharif and Nicole and me. And then I asked Chief Harrington, what do you instruct your police to do? And how do you expect us to operate in this atmosphere? And he said that we could embed with a mobile field force. We could embed with the police mobile field force. And you know, the next day I saw a Fox reporter with this Fox baseball cap in the middle of a kind of moving police organism that was making its way down the street. Embed. You understand what he means. Like reporters embedded in the front lines of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I am not saying that these reporters aren't brave who do this. They are. But I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. The Pentagon calls it a spectacular success. They developed the model, which is why I think it is a total failure. Now, when I said this last night, I noticed the guys in defense intelligence, they were kind of nodding their heads as well. Um, when you think about it, the reporters embedded in the front lines of troops, they're eating with the troops, they're sleeping with the troops, their life is in their hands. How do you think they're going to cover it? If you're going to in Afghan communities, in the peace movement around the world, to understand the full effects of war. And then the idea that they are using this flawed model of reporting and saying, this is how we must cover American cities. And the problem isn't only embedding with troops, it's embedding in the establishment in Washington. I mean, I've gone to many of the news conferences at the White House press room. Um, where reporters all too often enjoy that access of evil. I mean, <laughs> trading truth for access. You ask the whole question of the press secretary, and maybe when the president comes out, he'll call on you next, and you can go back and say, I got the power quote of the day. <laughs> but it's not worth the trade-off. We have a responsibility to ask the tough questions. They need us more than we need them, and it is very important that we, I will never say stick to our guns as a non-violent reporter, but that we stand our ground. Oh my God, I don't even want to use that term. Um, but that we do our jobs, as simple as that, that we do our jobs. Um, so we sued the Twin Cities uh, police, the authorities, the Secret Service, and well, we, we were involved with this for a number of years, for the last three years. And it's a horrid decision to do something like this, because we have so much to report every day. There's so much that we have to deal with in the world. But we also have to send a message that this is unacceptable. So we... So we were called by the judge um, just last year um, to try to settle the case, which we did. And we settled with an unprecedented settlement of six figures. Also, the, the Secret Service were furious. They wanted to be severed from the case. But we knew that they were the ones that ripped our credentials from around our necks. Actually, it's very hard to figure this out. Often you don't see a police officer's names or Secret Service, things are covered. It's really tough to figure this all out. But thanks to the police, we knew. Because remember when the police officer typed my handcuffs and we were enraged that they had ripped the credentials around our neck, I turned to the police and I said, how dare you? And he said, that wasn't us, that was the secret service. <laughs> so that was our first clue. Um, so they both, uh, we, they both had to remain in this case. And it was not only the money but it was getting the St. Paul police to develop a protocol in dealing with reporters. And after we got the settlement, we held the news conference. Well, we wanted to go to a place where many police officers would hear about the settlement so that we could send this message that you will have to pay a price if you continue with these unlawful arrests. And what better place last year than the height of the 
Occupy Wall Street and Canton and Zuccotti Park because we knew there would be hundreds of police officers there. And so we held that news conference with our reporter, Sharif had flown in at this point from Egypt. Um, and it is a warning not only not to arrest journalists, but not to engage in any unlawful arrests. The Occupy movement has been quite remarkable. Just, um, you know, the corporate media, how they dealt with Occupy. Uh, we just passed the first anniversary, September 17th. Um, The media first didn't report on it at all. I mean, we are in the media capital of the world in New York. It was down the street, and they just didn't report on it day after day. And then they were just forced to. It was too large a movement. It was happening in other cities. I think Washington is having their events, their anniversary, this Monday. Um, and so they started to ridicule it. Who are these people? What is their message? They don't know how, they have no leader. They're all saying different things, really. I actually think any Madison Avenue PR exec would drool to be the one to have come up with the slogan, we are the 99%. This is a slogan that is reverberated around this country, and part of its power is the multiplicity of issues. Everyone did have different issues, but they came together because they said, we are not satisfied with the direction this country is going. It brought in Tea Party people. It brought in Republicans, Democrats, and Defense, and, you know, it also brought in a lot of pizza. You know what happened. First there was Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin, uh, which was truly remarkable, 150,000 people marching in the freezing cold. And if you ever really thought whether these are profound movements, there we were covering uh, on this freezing cold day, First, inside the Capitol, they occupied it, they were all sleeping there overnight. The teachers were over here, the nurses were over here with their families, the police officers were sleeping, protecting the nurses and the teachers, because the police officers and the firefighters, though, uh, Governor Walker said, we're not targeting the police and the firefighters, just the teachers. The police said, if you're targeting them, you're targeting us. And they stood with those who were targeted. I mean, I never saw such a scene as in front of Governor Walker's office, young people with dreads, they were beating drums, and they were rocking out, and the police officers were rocking out next to them. <laughs> it was quite a scene. But outside, um, and inside the Capitol, I went up to the biggest guys I'd ever seen. They were Oshkosh prison guards. And I said, who did you vote for in the last election? They said, well, Governor Walker, of course. So I said, so what are you doing here? Protesting Governor Walker, of course. I said, well, but you voted for him. He said, he never said he was going to do this, bust the public unions. He's busting all of us. I was outside on this freezing cold day, and there's an older gentleman wearing glasses, carrying a sign that said, IRS auditors against Walker. <laughs> I said to him, who did you vote for? He said, well, Governor Walker. So I said, so why are you walking out here? He said, because he didn't say he would do this to us. I said, to you? He said, well, to our neighbors. And if he's doing it to them, he's doing it to us. Everyone had the same line. And I went up on one of these cranes and overlooked the whole state capitol grounds. It was an incredible scene. Um, you know, 1932, AFSCME was born in Wisconsin, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, the public union. You know, the John Birch Society also started in Wisconsin, in Appleton, Wisconsin, the racist, segregationist, anti-civil rights organization that was co-founded by Fred Koch, the father of Charles and David Koch. And this is a very interesting story, by the way. Um, you know, in 1964, Mitt Romney's father, Governor George Romney of uh, Michigan, uh, he had only been governor for two years, but a lot of people were saying, you've got to run for president against Mary Goldwyn. They were very concerned about Barry Goldwater. He is against civil rights, the Civil Rights Act, the uh, Voting Rights Act. And Romney agreed that he was a threat to the Republican Party, Barry Goldwater. And he went and he took his son, Mitt Romney, in his suit to his first convention. He didn't run then, Romney. He would run later. Um, but he did give a major address in front of the platform committee of the Republican convention, expressing his deep concern about extremism in the Republican Party, saying it could destroy uh, the Republican Party. He couldn't stand Barry Goldwater. Um, in fact, he wouldn't endorse him. And when Goldwater was very upset about this, he wrote him like a 12-page letter. Uh, Romney, Governor Romney, uh, ex 
explaining why he wouldn't endorse him. And the group that Governor Romney singled out in his speech was the John Birch Society, saying this will destroy us. Here is Governor Romney's son, now met, shaking hands with the son of the founder of the John Birch Society. Um, it's very interesting. It's just very interesting to see how these generations um, will unfold. So, just back to whatever it was I was talking about. <laughs> what? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So being on this crane and looking out over all of this and seeing the History Museum across the street and knowing the University of Wisconsin has this amazing archive. I'm sure Nate knows about this, living in Wisconsin and being at WORT. Um, amazing labor archives. I mean, think about how Martin Luther King died. May, April 4th, 1968. He died in Memphis, Tennessee. How? Well, why? Uh, well, what was he doing there? He was simply marching with sanitation workers who were trying to organize Local 1707, a local of AFSCME. And so when, especially young people say, they will admit it was black and white and you had these heroic struggles, but what is there to do right now? It's the same kind of struggle. I don't think you achieve democracy. I think you fight for it every single day. All of these different movements in this country are like we refer to other movements in other countries, are pro-democracy movements. And that is our job, our responsibility, in the most powerful country on earth, is to work for democracy every day. Unfortunately, we cannot rest. So Wisconsin, there was this remarkable uprising, and it inspired New York and the uh, Occupy movement there. And I was talking about the pizza. Egyptians were calling in orders for pizza pies and pizzerias in Wisconsin to be sent to the occupiers of the state capitol. And the same thing happened in New York. These pizzerias were thriving around Zuccotti Park. I mean, there were so many pizzas flying in to Zuccotti Park. Um, and the occupiers were very conservationist-minded. They would eat the pies. They called them occupies. They would eat the pies, and then they would take the boxes and they would make they would always use the lids for signs, and they had fantastic signs. I mean, I remember one of them, I will believe a corporation is a person when Texas executes one. <laughs> and then there was this freak snowstorm um, in October, and it, you know, everyone went under the tarps, and all the signs came down except for one on that pizza pie box. Hell snow, we won't go. <laughs> um, um, but other signs that had appeared on September 17th, that many of those oh, on the climate change issue, think of the movements that fueled Occupy. Because this country, the greatness of this country, is the movements that have fought for justice. Um, right before Occupy, were 1,200 people arrested in front of the White House forming a ring around the Rose Garden, right? 350.org and other groups deeply concerned about the XL Tar Sands pipeline that would be built from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they came up. And then there was the anti-death penalty movement. All those people who brought their signs into Zuccotti Park that said, I am Troy Davis. Troy Davis of Georgia. And I wanted to just read an excerpt of just one of our columns uh, when Troy Davis was set to die on September 21st, 2011. Uh, Troy Davis is the, we did a whole series of pieces on him because there's a nationwide movement, there's a global movement against the death penalty in the United States. The United States, the only industrialized country in the world to have the death penalty. It was so many phones. Um, on September 21st at 7 p.m., Troy Davis was scheduled to die. I was reporting live from George's death row in Jackson, waiting news about whether the Supreme Court would spare his life. After Zuccotti encampment, we raced down to Jackson, Georgia, 
we decided to do a broadcast. We didn't know whether Troy Davis would live or die that day, but we knew that we should be there. If we could have been in the execution chamber broadcasting the execution, I feel that that's where journalists should be. People in this country do not realize how controversial some do, uh, how unusual we are, how we stand alone in the industrialized world in instituting the death penalty. And I think it's very important we know what is done in our name, and then people make a decision about it. So we went down to the grounds of the prison. Um, Davis was sentenced to death for the murder of a Savannah off-duty police officer, Mark McPhail, in 1989. Officer McPhail was a hero cop. He was moonlighting, as, I think, at a Burger King, and a homeless man was being pistol whipped in the parking lot outside, and he went to his rescue, and he was shot dead, the police officer. And the question was, who shot him? And of course, that person should be punished. Um, seven, of the non, seven of the nine non-police witnesses at the trial later recanted or changed their testimony, some alleging police intimidation for their original false statements. One who did not recant was the man who many have named as the actual killer. Right after Officer McPhail was killed, this man appears at the local police station with his lawyer and points the finger at Troy Anthony Davis. Everyone, and most of the other um, witnesses pointed the finger at him. His name is Red Coles. No evidence linked Troy Anthony Davis to the shooting. Davis is one of more than 3,200 prisoners on death row in the United States. He'd faced three prior execution dates. With each one, global awareness grew. Amnesty International took up his case, the NAACP took up his case. Calls for clemency came from the Pope, from former FBI Director William Sessions, former Republican Georgia Congress member Bob Barr. And it was just this doubt that galvanized so much global outrage that led to people holding up these signs all over, too much doubt, I am Troy Davis. Vigils around the world. So we came to the grounds that day the fourth death warrant had been issued. We came from Atlanta, we went on the grounds of the prison, and the corrections officers gave us our press packet as journalists. And it was very interesting. It was a thin press packet. And it said that Davis would be given, he would see his family and friends in the morning, and he was scheduled to die at seven. Uh, but that at three o'clock they would have to clear out for a routine physical. Routine physical? You know that um, in Texas a while ago, a man attempted suicide who was on death row. They raced him to the hospital, they got him better, and then they executed him. Um, so at a local church down the road, Edward DuBose, the president of Georgia's NAACP, was speaking along with other human rights leaders um, on the, uh, about the case. DuBose questioned the physical, saying so they could make sure he's physically fit, so they can strap him down, so they could put the murder juice in his arm, make no mistake, they call it an execution, we call it murder. Then, in this press packet that was very thin, it mainly focused on what Troy Anthony Davis would be fed for dinner. It was very explicit and detailed. He had turned down the special meal that a death row prisoner gets, anything they want to eat. Um, the press kit described the standard tray Davis would be offered. Grilled cheeseburgers, oven brown potatoes, baked beans, coleslaw, cookies, and a great beverage. Then it also listed the lethal cocktail that would follow. It was on one piece of paper. It's like when you go into the eye doctor's office and you're reading the um, the lines to see what you can read. Four lines with big letters. That was a piece of paper in the press pack. It said on the top line, pentobarbital, then pancuronium bromide, potassium chloride, and ativan, in parentheses, a sedative. The pentobarbital anesthetizes, the pancuronium bromide paralyzes, the potassium chloride stops the heart, Davis could make a decision about two things, the Last Supper and the sedative. He refused both. By 7 p.m., the U.S. Supreme Court was reportedly reviewing Davis's plea for a stay. The case was referred 
to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who hails from Pinpoint, Georgia, a community founded by freed slaves that's near Savannah, where Davis had lived. The chorus for clemency grew louder. Alan Alt, the former prison warden of this prison in Georgia, along with five other retired wardens who were not opposed to the death penalty, opposed death for Troy Anthony Davis. The Supreme Court denied the plea. Davis's execution began at 10.53. The prison spokesperson delivered the news to the reporters outside, time of death, 11.08 p.m. We were broadcasting throughout. We had come to the grounds and we saw a prison pen that had been set up for protesters. They allowed 150 people on the grounds. Across the street there were a thousand people holding candles. Kids, students from Morehouse and Spelman, the historically black colleges in Atlanta had come. Um, inside in this prison pen were the family of Troy Anthony Davis uh, among them, Martina Correa, a remarkable woman. Her, she is the older sister of Troy. She, had, she was an army nurse. She battled breast cancer for 10 years. She fought for his life and for the life of other, and, and against the death penalty for years. Um, she was named one of the leading lights of the 20th century law with Nancy Pelosi. Her face adorned the mammogram vans in Savannah to provide mammograms to the indigent. Everyone knew Martina. Um, she would not die until she knew her brother would live. Um, she was there now in a wheelchair. Um, ben Jealous, the head of the NAACP, was there. Larry Cox, the head of Amnesty International USA. And so, of course, we were going to be there report reporting all through the night, but the guards told us we couldn't go near the pen. We'd have to be in another part of the grounds. I didn't come here to just speak myself. And I look at the other elite reporters, but no one's complaining. They've got their trucks, big trucks, way away from the people who should be interviewed. And so when our truck pulled up, we hired, you know, what Fox would hire the next day and CNN hired the day before. And now I really understood the power of doing it like the big boys do. The truck came on the grounds. The prison guards told us we had to be over there and be drivers of the truck said to me, where would you like this lady? Where do you want your truck? I said, well, the prison guard said, no, Ms. Goodman, where do you want it? I said, well, actually, I would like it right over by that protest pen. And they just plow through. The guards come up and these guys get out. They are our camera people for the day. And they say, now, where do you want to, where do you want to, where do you want to report from? I said, well, right by that rope. They hand me the mic and they say, start reporting. <laughs> and we did, and the prison guards step back. And so we brought you the voices of all of these people, the ups and downs through the day. At seven, when it was being considered by Clarence Thomas, people actually thought that a reprieve had been granted. And this wail went up across the street, all through the prison grounds, but then they understood that that wasn't the case. At 11.08, try Anthony Davis was dead. The eyewitnesses to the execution stepped out. You know how it works. Um, the prisoner is strapped down on a cross-like gurney with his arms out. And the witnesses are behind a glass window with a curtain. And when he's about to be killed, they open the curtain. And the prisoner is allowed a last statement. It's the family of the murder victim. Mark McPhail, his son, also named Mark McPhail, and the officer's brother. It's Davis's attorneys, and it's the reporters who will report on all of this. According to an Associated Press reporter who was there, these were Troy Davis's final words. He said, I'd like to address the McPhail family, let you know despite the situation you're in, I'm not the one who personally killed your son, your father, your brother, I'm innocent. The incident that happened that night is not my fault. I did not have a gun. All I can ask is that you look deeper into this case so that you really can finally see the truth. I ask my family and friends to continue to fight the fight. And then he turned to his executioners and he said, for those about to take my life, God have mercy on your souls. God bless your souls. The state of Georgia took Davis's body to Atlanta for an autopsy.
charging his family for the transportation. On Troy Davis's death certificate, the cause of death is listed simply as homicide. As I stood on the grounds of the prison, it was about a quarter to midnight, just after Troy Davis was executed. The Department of Corrections threatened to pull the plug on our broadcast. The show was over. I was reminded what Gandhi reportedly answered when asked what he thought of Western civilization. He responded, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> that movement has led to Connecticut being the 17th, 18th state that has declared a moratorium on the death penalty. Martina Correa would have been deeply moved by this, but weeks after her brother died, she also succumbed. She died of breast cancer a few weeks later. These are the movements that are so important to document, and I just want to end with a few quick stories about these movements. Um, one is the significance of this election year. Just let me say quickly, November 2008 was an historic moment. Whatever your political persuasion, the first African-American president in a land with a legacy of slavery was truly remarkable. I actually think the world heaved a sigh of relief that day. I think for so long people had felt that they had hit their heads against a brick wall. The wall had become a door. The door opened a crack, and the question is, would it be kicked open or slammed shut? So many people had worked so hard. So many different movements had come together. And people were tired. And I think after Obama was elected, also people didn't want to contribute to a right-wing backlash. Um, you know, the birther movement, the idea that he is the other, he couldn't possibly be from this country. And even if people were concerned about the direction the country was going, you know, the President Obama promised to close Guantanamo. He didn't preside over the longest war. U.S. history continues to. Um, is now the Obama administration prosecuting more whistleblowers for espionage than all presidents combined. Personally went to Copenhagen. Democracy Now! was broadcasting there as well as the other U.N. climate change summits and basically scuttled the entire summit at a time when climate change so severely threatens so many around the world and in this country. People are concerned, all of the movements who have elected him, but also concerned that they didn't want to contribute to another kind of attack. I think all of that came into play. Now, you have this community organizer, and the good thing is now parents all over this country will say to their children, maybe you can be a community organizer too, um, become the commander in chief. So who does the community organizing now? Um, after Senator Obama was elected, but before he became president, I was invited on CNN because the Obamas were going into the White House, were going to be taken around by the Bushes, and they asked me to comment. So I was sitting in the CNN studio, and I'm watching them go into the White House, and, um, and there are other pundits on, and they're commenting on something else. But I see them walking inside, I said, wait, we have to take pause. Barack Hussein Obama, Michelle Lavon Robinson Obama, she is the descendant of slaves from the Carolinas, which means their daughters, Malia and Sasha, are the descendants of slaves, about to live in the most famous house on earth, the White House, which is built by slaves. Let's just take pause. And it made me think about a house a couple of hours from the White House. Um, well, an area of eastern shore of Maryland where Frederick Douglass was born the greatest abolitionist of all time. You know, he was enslaved as a youth and a teenager, and it might not surprise you to know he was a troublesome slave. And so he was handed to a man called a slave breaker. His name was Ed Covey. His property was Mount Misery. And Douglas was brought there. Covey beat him, tortured him, but Frederick Douglass fought back, escaped, headed north, and changed the world. He founded the North Star newspaper. Um, and that property on the eastern shore of Maryland, St. Michael's, Mount Misery, is owned today by Donald Rumsfeld. He bought it in 2003, Secretary of Defense, near his close friend, Vice President Dick Cheney. Mount Misery is 
Donald Trump spells vacation home. <laughs> so I was very surprised by this when I read I thought, is this at all possible? So Dennis and I headed down to St. Michael's to see if it's true. Now I should say, in New York, I love this independent coffee house downtown. It's this old brick building, and on the outside there's this plaque that says, this was the printing press of David Ruggles, born a free black man in Connecticut, and he gave refuge to Frederick Douglass when he first came north. Think about it. Frederick Douglass started the North Star newspaper. David Ruggles had this printing press. These men saw the media as liberation, as emancipation, because information is power. So, we head down to St. Michael's, and as we drive into St. Michael's, I realize I have no idea where Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld lives. We have like an hour, because I have to go speak in Washington, D.C. But then I see this organic coffee shop in front of me, and I think, oh, they'll tell the truth. So I go inside. I go inside, and they said, what would you like? I said, I'd like to know where Donald Rumsfeld lives. They said, oh, just go out back, drive down the road, you'll hit Mount Misery Road, don't, they go, you'll hit Mount Pleasant Road, don't go down that road, make a right, another right, you'll hit Mount Misery Road, go to the end, and that's where he lives. So we're on to something. So we drive down the road, we don't go down Mount Pleasant Road, we make a right and another right, it seems we couldn't go right enough. But then we, we get to the end of the road, we see the black tinted windows of the Secret Service SUV, and I know we've arrived. So I get out quickly, I take out my video camera, I'm zooming in as they're zooming out. And I'm thinking, does Secretary Rumsfeld know the significance of this place? But sure enough, as I zoom in, I see a stake in the ground next to the driveway that says Mount Misery. So we race off to this ancient black church down the road. It's Sunday morning, and folks have gathered in the sanctuary. They're having Sunday school. And I asked one of the older women, she's a descendant of slaves. I said, my gosh, what a historic area. You have Frederick Douglass born here. He was tortured at Mount Misery. Now Donald Rumsfeld owns Mount Misery. He is known for torture. What do you think of this? And she said, I can't comment right now. We're in church. <laughs> So we headed from Mount Misery to Mount Hope. That was in Rochester, because I was speaking at a school in Rochester, New York. It was in the middle of a big snowstorm. And a young woman came up to me after, and she said, could I take you to Mount Hope Cemetery tomorrow morning? I said, well, I'm racing. I'm going to get a plane at like 6 in the morning to Denver, and it's a big snowstorm. She said, please, I'll meet you at 4. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I meet you at four in front of the cemetery. So I pull up, and there she is in her parka, covered in snow, and we slosh over to Frederick Douglass's tombstone, and we're wiping the snowflakes off, and it was amazing. And then she said, could I take you to one more tombstone? I said, oh my God, I should plead. So we make our way across this vast cemetery, and there is the tombstone of Susan B. Anthony, who is buried next to her sister. Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass were not only allies, they were friends. And there is a statue near Susan B. Anthony's house, not of a general, but of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass having tea together. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass was not only a great abolitionist, he was a great feminist. He seconded the women's rights at the Seneca Women's Rights Convention of 1848 the resolution calling for women to have the right to vote. And Susan B. Anthony supported the anti-slavery movement. These are the movements that have made this country great. So I race to the airport and miss my flight. <laughs> <laughs> I call up Dennis, you gotta get me on the next plane to Denver, they're gonna kill me. And he brings up the blueprints of the airport. He's an unbelievable researcher of the airport. He says, I've got the blueprints. I go, what is blueprints? I just need to know. He says, I just need to know, are you in the Susan B. Anthony wing or the Frederick Douglass wing of the airport? I said, what are you? And this is no time to joke. And then I look, and there it is. It says Susan B. Anthony, and this wing says Frederick Douglass. Every once in a while, you have to stop and smell the coffee. So I got on the next flight, and I made it to Denver. Now, um, Rosa Parks follows from this story. And why it's important to tell this story, because I'm sure all of you know what Rosa Parks did, is because the media gets it wrong. When Rosa Parks died, we raced to Washington for the big ceremony before the funeral in Detroit. 
You know, Rosa Parks sat down on the bus December 1st, 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama and refused to get up for a white passenger. And in so doing, she launched the modern day civil rights movement. A few days later, December 5th, the Montgomery Improvement Association holds its meeting to choose their leader to lead the bus boycott that will lead to the desegregation of the transportation system. And they choose a young minister who just come into town, Dr. Martin Luther King. Rosa Parks helped to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. When we went to this big service in the church in Washington, oh, I mean, it was amazing. Oprah was inside, Cicely Tyson was inside, thousands were outside. They erected speakers so you could hear outside what was happening inside. We were outside where it's more often interesting to be. I interviewed a young college freshman, and I said to her, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I emailed my professors. I said, I won't be in class today. I'm going to get an education. <laughs> so. I remember CNN's report about Rosa Parks. You know, she was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda before they brought her to the church. They said she was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. <laughs> she knew exactly what she was doing when she sat in the bus. She was the secretary of the local NAACP. She worked with Edie Nixon. He came out of radical labor politics. He had worked with A. Philip Randolph to organize the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the black conductors on the Pullman trains who were all called George, not because their mother's name than that, but because that was the owner's name, George Pullman. You know why they needed to be organized. And A.D. Nixon and Rosa Parks have been strategizing for years about how to challenge the racist laws. She had trained at the Highlander Center. King had been there as well, black and white together, to most effectively strategize to change the world. Um, she had sat down on the bus before and refused to get up, like other young women. You never know when the magic moment will come. But if you are involved with social change, you will help to build a foundation that will determine history, determine the future. And the media denigrates an activist. But what could be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? And that's certainly what those are saying. Brave she was just a few months before the summer of 1955, Emmett Till, 14-year-old African-American boy living in Chicago with his mom, Mamie Till, and she sends him to get out of the city for the summer to Money, Mississippi. He's with his aunt and uncle and his um, cousins asleep at night. He's dragged out of bed by a white mob. They said he wolf-whistled at a white woman, and he ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. He wolf whistled at a white woman. His mother, Mamie, he had a stutter, and his mother taught him whenever he stuttered, whistle, and it'll clear it up. So he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. When his body was dredged up and sent back to Chicago, his mother did something incredibly courageous. She said she wanted the wake, at the wake and the funeral, his casket open. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands streamed by his casket and saw. And then Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs of his distended head. And they were actually published. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the images of war every day, the top of every radio and TV newscast about a baby dead on the ground, uh, the, on everyone's Facebook wall, some reference to war, a woman maybe with her legs blown off by cluster bombs or a drone attack that kills civilians. Um, every email, every newspaper, surviving newspaper above the fold, a picture and a story of a soldier dead and dying for just one week. Americans are a compassionate people. They would say no. War is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. And I'll end with this. There was this Egyptian blogger in Takrir named Kareem Amr. He was a young guy. And he was in prison for four years before Takrir for blogging against the state. He got out during the revolution. And he was there blogging about it as well. And one day, in the last few days before Mubarak fell, no one could find Karim. He had left Tahrir. They last saw him walking away, and they couldn't find him. 
So that was the week Dennis and I were doing our column, and I was texting Sharif and saying, where's Kareem, where's Kareem? And Dennis went to Kareem's blog, and on the top it said, dedicated to Hans and Sophie Scholl. Hans and Sophie Scholl were a German brother and sister during World War II. And together with their professor, other workers and students, they formed something called the White Rose Collective. Um, they weren't Jewish, they were German Christians, but they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? And they thought the best they could do was to get information out so that the Germans would never be able to say we didn't know. And so they published a series of six pamphlets. And on the fourth pamphlet it said, we will not be silent. They distributed these everywhere. They would drop them in a marketplace in the middle of the night, in an alleyway, um, in a schoolyard. And then Hans and Sophie and their professor were captured. They were arrested by the Nazis. They were charged, tried, convicted, and beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy.